So guys, I'm uh, Neil Rankin from Net Zero Capital. We are a private equity firm based here in London, uh, and we are involved in a lot of early stage incubation, and we uh, see and invest and uh, indeed help a lot of uh, projects in the space come to market. And I'll let you guys introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Filippo. I'm a go-to-market advisor for Web3. Uh, both working with Web3 Native Ventures and brands joining the Web3 space. I'm also a lecturer at the Binance University um, for the Masters in Crypto and Blockchain. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Emily Delara. I am the host and founder of Web3 and Thrive, which is a new podcast um, focused on female leaders in the space. I've been a CMO and marketing leader in the space for the last seven years, and um, I specialize on product marketing. I advise for multiple um, business in, businesses at um, startup stage in the space, and I'm a huge advocate for um, female empowerment in Web3. Oh, you got one? Hi folks, I'm Alex Mogul. Um, I'm the head of infrastructure and staking at Republic Crypto. Uh, Republic is a capital fundraising platform and Republic Crypto supports the growth of projects from seed to liquidity and then we operate infrastructure on various networks um, and I lead that part of our business. Hi everyone, I'm Mohammed. I'm the head of tokenomics at Animoco Brands and I focus on designing and building the token economies for a lot of the subsidiaries and projects we invest in. Thanks, guys. Um, can you give uh, Filippo your mic? Thank you. I'm going to kickstart our argument. Yeah, yeah there we go. Uh, okay, let's get started. It's, it's, it's nice up here. It's quite cozy. I like it. So. Was the last one good? Were the tax guys good? Are they okay? Yeah? They're going to get a shock when they go out and see what Quasi has been up to in the, uh, during the duration. So, Filippo, you are a go-to-market advisor. Um, so when a project comes to you, whether it's pre or post money, and uh, they're looking to uh, get a start in the space, you know, where, where do you start? What is your first advice about how they bring a product to market? Um, <clears throat> I think the question that should be asked here is why should you bring your product to market in the first place? Um, if I ask most of the people in the conference um, to tell me about what they're doing, they'll probably say, <clears throat> We're doing this, and this is how we're better than everyone else, right? And instead of talking about their vision and getting people um, engaged in their vision. Um, so it should always be about the why. And the why is essentially the who, um, which is your audiences. So the first sort of two steps are understanding who it is that you're actually speaking to when, when um, marketing your product or bringing it to market. And then obviously targeting um, the message um, for those people. And understanding the who is, is so critical because at the end of the day, your product is about making a person, um, enabling a person to make change, right? And we're all change makers here. We're all in the business of implementing change for people. And it's not about a fancy feature or a function. It's about the rational and emotional impact there is for our customers or users or the people that we onboard. Um, so yeah, I think that's the basically first step. Um, and instead of, you know, the, the, the big misconception here I think is for a product that is coming to market in the beginning, it's always about product market fit and everyone's so focused on getting the product market fit and getting the product market fit within the Web3 community. Um, and I think that there's two, two things here to, to bring up. One is that it's about audience message fit, first of all, right? We spoke about the, the message and, and, sorry, the audience, that, that is really important, and the message, which is obviously making it compelling for them to, to make that change. Um, and, and obviously, um, you know, the, the idea of, of audience message fit is, is critical here. And the second sort of point is we're all so focused on onboarding um, the Web3 community. And the Web3 community is, is, is the very, very beginning, right? We know that the market size of the Web3 community is, is very, very limited at the end of the day. And what we all want to do and what we all want to remember is that all of our audiences are actually in Web2. And that's where the big money is. So, yeah. Um, and, and on that, on audience message fit, Emily, at what stage do you think um, you should be looking to start building your community? Um, so again, that goes back to the why. Why are you wanting to create a community? So it's really about understanding who are you looking to tap into, the audience, and um, what are you trying to achieve, and at what stage do you want to bring people in to use your product? And I think the most important thing to think about is 
when you start to think, you're having to look at all the other competitors in, in your space and you're looking at everybody's numbers and you're um, maybe putting a, a marker on having growth in your community, understanding, okay, do I want to grow this community because everybody else is growing the community? Is it to boost my token price? Or am I really wanting to drive a purpose into this community? And is this the right stage to do it? Is that the kind of answer you're looking for? <laughs> yeah, I think absolutely. I mean, what, what would you say the true power of a community is? Um, the true power of the community would really be, first of all, what is a community? So the community, <laughs> which I think we need to talk about, um, a community isn't just a group of speculative investors. Some, in some cases it is, but the community is your first core users of a potential product or your first core um, evangelists of a brand, right? So this is who you look for, look to, to get advice, to understand what you should build, how you should build it. They're your first call for referrals and bringing on new partners and stuff. So this is who your community is. What was the first, last part of the question? <laughs> I've got a fun one here. What's the power of the community? What the power of a solid community yeah. is. So when, once you see it like this, then you understand the power, which is they can ultimately they can help you to instate yourself as a brand and a product, and they can become your number one referrers and bring in more users as a free acquisition tool, basically. Once you've got, a, like, you can build these organically. You don't need to spend, like, 50000 a month on marketing. Um, that's the power of having a community. Sure. And, I mean, how do you encourage... You, you, you talked about speculative interest, and I think, obviously, we see a, an incredible amount of that in the space. How do you think we encourage market participation and try to steer people away from purely speculative interest? I think number one is not marketing your token only. So like having your purpose is number one and in making sure that the community you build around it understand and follow your purpose as well. So that's number one. And number two, understanding that even if you have a token, there's a bigger cause towards this. And bringing in market participation is understanding, is this something that's going to be usable, right? So I don't just want to bring people into a community to speculate on whether the token price is going to increase or not. You want to bring them in to actually utilize something, which we could go to utility yeah. and talk about that. I, I mean, I guess a community can work against you in some respects. If all you have is a speculative value and you build a community around that you know, promise of eternal riches, then when we see a market downturn, as, as we do, uh, well, as, as we do now and as we've seen historically um, I guess that you know you have to be careful that you don't end up with a community that are kind of, of ag ag against you exactly yeah exactly so again it's how do you encourage from the kind of inception stage a community of participants mm -hmm. people that want to participate in the economy mm -hmm. um, in the and, and is it only about economy and what else are we looking for as we, as we kind of move into the next phase of web 3 what are we looking for? What are, what's the promise? What's the, you know, what's the draw? What yeah. are we, what are we um, offering as a space to participants over and above just pure economics? Well, I think we could go back to the purpose, isn't it? Like that you're going to have a further impact by being part of this space versus what you're currently having right now. And there's all these other benefits to being part of Web3, but the one core um, initiative that I would focus on as a founder of one of these companies is to have that core purpose first. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to add Yeah, I was going to say, like, mo I mean, <clears throat> so many, at the moment, when we ask people to onboard to Web3, we're basically asking them to use a technology they'd never used before to do something that they never needed to do before. So unless, you know, we're actually solving a problem, and most projects today are kind of, you know, the, the space has changed a lot in the last six months, right? And, and you know, projects up until six months ago were kind of, oh, we're, we're kind of seeing where this is going. And like you said, it was the, the nature of the time investment or money investment was speculative. Um, and now it's, it's moved from that. And it's very similar to, you know, more traditional sort of tech in terms of the impact, long-term impact, rational impact, and uh, emotional impact for the, for the users. So, yeah. yeah. Um, and so we were talking about that. Alex, um, how do you think it differs when we... Uh, consider a, a Web3 native uh, product, okay, which is built for the, the space. The, the participants are people who are familiar in the space. Um, how does that differ when we look to a Web2 company or product, and how do we, um, when, when they're looking to port their product into the space, is it, is it a different offering? Are, should we be looking at 
um, you know, the value proposition differently? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, I think the go-to-market fundamentals are the same, you know, sort of regardless of the underlying technology, right? You want to solve a problem that's important to people and solve it in a way that's better than the alternatives. When, you know, I guess the difference between starting within Web3 and uh, beginning with a Web2 technology that you then poured over to Web3 is you're either solving a, a new problem, right? and Web3 technology enables you to do that. Or you're solving an existing problem better than your Web2 product does. I think getting really clear on the problem that you're solving and why solving it using Web3 technology is better than the alternatives is actually the most uh, important thing for a company moving from Web2 to Web3 to get really, really clear on. It makes the product development cycle move much more quickly. It makes the marketing somewhat obvious. Um, it makes it clear who you're talking to and what you're talking about. Um, but you look at, you know, for example, I don't know, even something like, uh, okay, so from a supply chain perspective, you know, FedEx is a big logistics um, company in the United States, and they wanted to use blockchain as a way of improving traceability throughout the chain of custody. Uh, that solves a problem better than Web2 technology does today. There are certain interoperability challenges associated with Web2 technology, you know, that Web3 kind of solves. Uh, similarly, you look at like NBA Top Shot or something like that, right? While owning a piece of that history is something that wouldn't have otherwise been possible for uh, the fans, you know, and, and owning a piece of that history um, sort of activated their loyalty. Thinking about taking a Web2 product, right, and porting it over to a new technology has to come with some clear sense of the problem that you're solving um, and how that's different uh, from, from the, the way that you've solved it today. And, and, and how do you avoid um, building a product that is a solution to a problem that doesn't exist. And I guess this, I mean, th this happens in Web 2 as well, but I think in Web 3, it's th there's more uh, probability of it happening because again, quite often the primary motiv motivation is, 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 is economic. So at what stage should you be kind of, and I, I guess it uh, speaks back to the question I, I asked you, Emily, at what stage should you be testing the market? How do you test the market? Should you be building a community first and a product after, I mean, obviously, you're going to have a, a broad sense of what your product is, but in terms of the product market fit, should you be um, polling, referencing your community and designing the product with them? Yeah, rapid testing is so important. Listen, um, there is no perfect product pilot. You have to learn by launching and getting feedback as quickly as possible. When you have stickiness, you know, uh, your adoption metrics are, you know, up and to the right, which is, you know, sort of what we always hope for. Um, but you have to find out quickly. I think doing a ton of research in advance, uh, listen, you, you introduce the solution to a problem and, you know, the adoption will tell you whether or not that solution was better than the alternative. Trying to research your way into that solution is often counterproductive. But once you get there, um, it, you know, and, and listen, like that kind of rapid testing is actually a little bit easier in Web 2, I think, than it is in Web 3. Um, you know, there tends to be uh, sort of challenges with rolling changes back in Web3 in the same way that we often do with Web2 technology. You know, we roll back, redeploy, roll back, redeploy, toggle on, toggle off. It's a harder thing to do, I think, in, you know, in Web3. Um, but ultimately, to the extent that you have a product that has, you know, a web interface, um, you know, you can continue to test as rapidly as possible to find out what solves the problem best. And Following on from that, how, how much is the user experience um, important to the design of the product? And I mean that, obviously, the user experience is, is important, but I mean in the sense of how exposed do you think people need to be to the underlying technology? Do you think when people are looking to port businesses into Web3, do, do consumers care that it's on a blockchain? you got to find out. I, I, there's no way to know in advance, right? I mean, it depends on what the alternatives are. 
the alternatives are really clunky, then you know, an excellent user experience might actually be the differentiator that solves the problem better than the alternatives. But uh, you know, it's case by case. And I think sometimes when you're solving a really important problem and you're the only one doing it, the user experience can be a little bit clunky as long as people are sufficiently motivated to kind of get over that usability hurdle. But I, I, you know, it kind of depends. What do you think the motivations are? Um, you know, we talk in, uh, in the space a lot about utility. You know, economies, tokens have a utility. They, they, they give you, the, the value in them um, is some sort of function that they can perform. Careful now, with that word. Careful with the word utility. Uh, it's been well, overused. Well, <laughs> I, it, 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 it absolutely is. It, 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 it isn't, it, it's an enormously overused word. It's a buzzword. And so I guess my question is, what, what other buzzwords, what other incentives should we uh, be looking for? M Mohammed, when, when you consider how to, to build a, um, a token economy, moving away from this, I, this, this word tokenomics into you know, uh, an economy, how do we build a substantive economic model with inputs, outputs, throughputs, and, and what other uh, incentives are you looking for? I think incentives is a really good place to start because we've misunderstood incentives. We think incentives is about just giving money out, and that's what most of the projects do. Do an action, you'll get paid in this token, then you sell that token off, and the price crashes, which actually acts as a disincentive. So what we should be foc focusing on instead of incentives is what motivates people to come into this platform, what motivates people to come into this ecosystem, and start from the motivation factor as opposed to the incentive layer. In an example, move to earn, move to earn makes no sense. If I want to get fit, I want to get fit to have a healthier lifestyle, to be in better shape. My, my, that's my motivation. But an incentive of you get to get some tokens isn't going to be the deciding factor for me to come into an ecosystem. But if my motivation is, well, I get to use this app and maybe I get a free gym pass, a free one-day gym pass, or I get, I accrue enough points or tokens to then be able to cash these in and ha get a spa experience or something like that, that's a much stronger motivation for me to come into an ecosystem because I know what I'm getting out. And then from the economic layer, it's not, it's not linear where I earn a token, I then dump the token on the market. It's I earn this token and now I'm utilizing this token within an ecosystem because there are genuine use cases that, that are there. Yeah, it's, it's value creation. Yep. How, so how do, you cr how, do, or how do you ensure that you are creating value for and with the community rather than extracting value from that community. I think this was the point that all the panelists made earlier actually, it's that building with the community in mind and it's not build it and they'll come or let's try to perfect the product, it's let's stress this with the community. So this is something we've done for example with Sandbox with each of the different seasons that are being released. It's a stress test, we engage the community, we get feedback to the community, back to the drawing board, what do we need to change, what assumptions were correct. Um, Phantom Galaxies is another one, one of the first AAA games on the blockchain. What did we do with that? Free NFT drop, and then it allowed you to access the game and download and play the game. We got over 100,000 users in the very first season of, of that game as well, and it's then building alongside the community, because they'll tell you, do we need this, do we not? Is this something we want? As opposed to, let's spend millions and millions of dollars, and then no one comes to our platform. Sure. I mean, I guess that, that's it. How do we monetize these communities without exploiting them? You know, how do we ensure the longevity of projects by you know, bringing them along for the ride, but ensuring that they can get something back? And rewards is a very good way of thinking about it, right? I mean, it's a tale as old as time. Like the, the, the rewards industry is an <laughs> enormous industry, and I guess that's how historically brands have um, kind of formed communities and, 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 and uh, maintained loyalty is by re rewarding the participants. So I guess that's what we need to start looking at, is how do we incorporate the best bits of that into our ecosystem? I think from that front, it's if we focus on the Web 2 layer as opposed to the, to the Web 3 layer, currently what we're selling is blockchain. It's all of these buzzwords. I mean, thank you for the comment on utilities, and I think I've managed to get through without saying utility once so far, but we focus too much on the tech. Now, I guess I want to ask a question to the audience. How many of us actually know how the internet works? Show of hands. My point, okay, we have one, two people, three people. That's the point. 
when someone's selling a platform on Facebook, then say, we've built in C++, and Twitter's like, we've built on JavaScript. No one cares. It's what's the final user experience, what problem is being solved. That's what we need to be focusing on, not what tech is it built on. This is the amount of transactions per second. Who cares? Yeah. Does anybody care? That was my question earlier. Does anybody care how this stuff works? Pro probably not, right? Not, not writ large. Not when you take it out to the mass market. Not when you look to bring um, users and adoption in. Sure, if, if we're just continuing to you know, provide you know, ever niche services to the existing kind of space, it's, it's maybe more relevant. But I kind of feel like we now need to look you know, beyond our walls and see how we can encourage adoption. Just to press a little bit there, though, it is sort of like a core tenet, right, of delegated proof of stake that a delegate is trusting a validator to, to um, understand how the network works and operate it excellently. And if you want to delegate stake on a proof of stake protocol, you really should understand how it works. So I, I think it does kind of depend a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Sure. I mean, I, I guess the, um, the uh, kind of the, the buzzwords, the, the sort of the understandable elements of it are, are super important. As in, I mean, I think people can buy into the idea of self-sovereignty, okay? People can uh, buy into the idea of monetizing their data for themselves rather than for somebody else. Security, you know, being your own bank. I think all these kind of things are, um, as uh, premises, are, are very understandable. I, I just wonder, in terms of the user experience, how much exposure do you ne actually need to have to or understand the, 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 the tech? Yeah, you know? depends on the product. Yeah, I, I also think... you look think... like you need a mic? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we all got a point to say here. But I think it really also depends who you're selling to, right? So if you're B2D and you're selling to developers, they need to understand how it all works, right? If you're selling B2C and you're, you've got a wallet, there's so many... I actually made a podcast episode about this. So it's going to launch on Monday. <laughs> but you talk about, okay, you're a wallet. You come to a wallet page, you talk about what the wallet's built on, if it's decentralized, if it's non-custodial, you throw all these words around... I just want to know how to buy an NFT, right? I'm going to exit this page quickly. I don't understand what you're telling me. This is, this is what I think we're trying to get to the point of, is who needs to know what and what do we need to put under the hood? Exactly like you said. Like I, I just wanted to reinforce that. Like if you're selling to EVM, okay, like you, you, know, you need to be able to sell to developers. If you're gaming, then you need to be able to sell to gamers. Like it's, it's really about... Who, who, who's on the other side, right? And if you're selling to, if you're a, a metaverse as a service company and selling to brands and you're, your persona is like the head of innovation at Louis Vuitton, don't talk to this guy about like how it integrates or all that kind of stuff. It's like, okay, think about, like you should talk to the guy about how, how you know, the, the, having a metaverse will you know, enable the next level of customer engagement or brand loyalty. Don't talk about stuff that's irrelevant and doesn't speak to the core need of that person. So yeah, it's pretty elementary, but. I think to Neil, Neil's point earlier, I think a, f a few years back when Meta brought out WhatsApp, there was a big, how can I put it, a lot of people were like, we're going to leave WhatsApp, we're going to go to Signal, we're going to move to Telegram, I'm still using WhatsApp. How many of us are still using WhatsApp? Yeah, yeah exactly. So it's, it's, we know there's an issue, but we're still using the tech. So even then, when there's a problem that we know exists and there are solutions to it, we still continue to use WhatsApp, and it's, it's the idea of understanding behavioral psychology as well, that if not enough people move from one platform to another platform, you're not then going to gain adoption. Yeah. And it's incentives, right? How do you incentivize people to do so? There needs to be, there needs to be a draw. And what? motivations. One thing, though, that's just interesting is it's like when stuff goes wrong, right, that, you know, the, the community sort of shifts to a blaming mentality, right? Like, why didn't you do your diligence? You didn't know that was non-custodial? You didn't know that was custodial? Like, you, you know, so I, it depends. If you want to really take accountability for adverse impact to something going wrong, you know, then you do kind of have to know. And maybe that's another challenge to solve, right? It's so funny. It's like, um, you know, like, where's the wallet support team? Well, if it's a non-custodial wallet, I mean, nobody can help you, right? So. And, and there's a little bit of push-pull there, right? Because you also want to provide people who are using that wallet with an excellent experience because you built it and you have pride in it and you understand how it works and you want to make it better, right? So you kind of need to understand what challenges people are having. So there is, I mean, there's tension there, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's one of the most, or it can be one of the most forgiving spaces in some respects 
um, when things do go wrong. Okay? And, but I think that comes back, and I guess the, the relevance is how strong you build your community. Strong communities in crypto can be incredibly forgiving. We've seen some stuff go really, really wrong. Yeah. And as long as the, the explanation, the messaging, the PR, the, you know, the aftermath is delivered in a, a, you know, a, a certain way, and critically, as long as the community really is invested, and, and I mean that in a sort of broader sense than just financially, I think we, we see some really strong, um, we, we see some really uh, strong communities that, that, you know, they let a lot of stuff ride. And again, how, how do you, so bringing your product to market, how, what's the secret sauce there? How, what do you look to do um, and how do you try to attract the right sort of market participants rather than just, um, you know, the, the speculators? It's, it's about value creation, right? What, what value are you creating over and above economic value, I think? In a community trusting you, I mean, trust is something that you build over time with your community, right? Like what drew them there may not be the same thing that keeps them there. Sure. Over time, being transparent with the community, um, you know, which, uh, I mean, it's not always there, right? But I think the kinds of communities that you're talking about um, are forgiving when you're honest. Yeah. I think the other side of it is the Web3 community is so small as well. We have all of these projects and platforms going for the, exactly the same user base. But a lot of these user base speculators, they've come in for money. That's it. It's free money being handed out. Why am I not going to come in? And it's, just, and it's like moving away from using buzzwords. So we have to be aiming a lot of these platforms at our Web2 communities. And that means selling Web2 products. Even if the back end is Web3, we cannot be talking about the blockchain with the consumer. We have to be talking about the user experience. Um, and then the value add, the different motivators to come into this ecosystem and then take it from there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think when it comes to communities as well, if we think back to, I'm just going to give an example, Mount Gox, right? So I don't know if you all know what Mount Gox, what Mount Gox was. It was one of the, well, it was the first exchange, right? And um, back then the community was everybody on Reddit, the people who had first built out crypto, the Bitcoin economy as it, as it was back in, when was it, 2010, nine? Can't remember what the date was. Anyway, Mount Gox got hacked but it was the only exchange where you could actually buy and sell your <clears throat> Bitcoin at the time. And when it got hacked, um, and I don't know if you've read, um, what's it called? I'll think of it in a minute, by Nathaniel Popper, the book, um, Digital Gold. And they tell the story of how Mt. Gox got hacked and how the community rallied around to kind of save, try and save everybody's funds. They all kind of stuck together because their, their goal and their purpose was the same, to bring... De decentralized, basically to bring their decentralized um, ideological concept to life. And if Mt. Gox was going down, does that mean that that concept is going to be destroyed? So the, the community rallied around. So you can see that when um, projects get hacked, or for example, Celsius, I mean, Celsius have tried to be as transparent as, transparent as possible, and you still see people sticking around. People are still putting money into Celsius yeah. after they, they were like yeah. stopping withdrawals. Like I was, yeah. It's crazy. I was on the crisis team for OKX when they stopped withdrawals and deposits. No, they didn't stop deposits. They stopped withdrawals. I think it was 36 days or something in total. And this was a huge crisis, but everyone stuck around. People kept depositing yeah. funds because they fully trusted and believed that it was going to be fine. And I think they're like really great examples of how having this core community from day one and giving them a reason to believe in you will help you in the long run. It's the value of a community. Guys, we should take some questions. Does anybody yeah. have any questions for our panel? Any questions, folks? Is anyone brave enough? There's a man at the there back. Let's get him the microphone. It was 2013. The Thank you very much. Actually, um, I was a little bit skeptical about creating the communities blindly because you can just see the recent fall of Luna, which was a very promising project with a bad tokenomics design. And then people saw that what happened to the industry and everyone fell down. So I think uh, education is more important uh, across all spheres. Just a question. Uh, okay. 
So uh, education is very important across all spheres. So uh, what do you think that, for example, you were talking about uh, educating or taking the responsibility of some silos rather than the whole community taking the responsibility of everything. So how the education will basically play the role across all the so ecosystems? Education is super important, but I think for when we look at consumers, they don't care fundamentally. They just want an app that works. And this is coming from someone who's been in education for 10 years prior to pivoting into, into crypto. I completely agree. There needs to be that foundational layer of education, but who cares? Yeah. It's, it's, and it's a genuine answer. And I mean, what was what was the value proposition? What was the community being built on in Luna? You know, I mean, I guess that comes back to the message. And what what is your expectation of your community, and what is their expectation of you? You know, Luna was a pretty speculative community. Um, that's not to say that there wasn't any value proposition there, but I think that's where the messaging is important, right? It's like what 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 type of community do you want to build? Do you want participants? Or do you want speculators looking to come in and get rich? And then back, back to the learning point, one of the best ways for people to learn is, is via their experiences. So it has been an experiential li um, learning curve from, from that perspective. And that can only happen if that community already exists and then they're using the platform or they're within that ecosystem to then learn as they go along. And then from my point of view, it's that's how we start to transition people from Web2 into this safe space called Web2.5 or whatever you want to call it, to eventually for them to end up in Web3 or be Web3 native. I also think, okay, so um, from like a data visualization and legibility perspective, like there's an industry-wide opportunity, let's call it. Um, I, you know, you can see a lot of things happening on chain. Interpreting them is really hard right now. Um, that, so listen, what, what happened with Terra Luna is really, really unfortunate. Um, and could it have been foreseen? Maybe, but um, you need to be able to interpret what you're looking at. And um, there are a select few individuals, I think, who do that really well right now. And they're almost like influencers at this point, right? Because they can interpret blockchain data. Um, education is important, but also just legibility. You know, we're not taking advantage of transparency that we can't interpret. So I think there's product opportunities there as well, for whatever it's worth. But, uh, you know, uh, they are not always uh, revenue generating. And so funding for those projects tends to come out of, um, you know, like ecosystem fund coffers, et cetera. And so they're kind of slow to get going, but um, huge opportunity, I think. I think that education, sorry, I'm not sure if it answers your question uh, per se, but I don't think it should be used as, as a mean to <clears throat> hold people accountable or, or stuff like that. It, it sh it's like education is our responsibility as, as early adopters um, to bring people on board. That's what it is. So, you know, look, look at some of the, like, the earlier stage pro projects, right? Like that started. I'm not talking about Yuga Labs. Let's say like vFriends, right? You, you know, if you looked at like what vFriends did in the beginning, they actually had um, sessions about how to buy an NFT. That, that could mean, you know, various things to many people and it could lead to people actually g going off on other projects. But, you know, at, at the end of the day, there was a strong personality that was educating a market that was completely ignorant as to how to behave with like digital ownership and digital assets. And it worked because obviously, I mean, like they were one of the main drivers, they were blue chip, you know, agencies were built at the back of it. Like there's a lot of, you know, Potentially, they're the biggest onboarders of brands joining Web3. Like, education is, you know, I think that any product today that is putting themselves out there should have a product-led motion with, like, sort of an academy motion, right? You, you should be able to allow your users to enable, going back to the initial point, to enable your users to become who they want to become. And there should be, like, sort of an academy or a, sort of a, a teaching environment where you're able to allow those people to become who they want to become by using your product, by uh, you basically solving their problem. So, yeah. Um, we're running out of time now, guys. We've got one more question at the back, if, uh, if that's okay. So I'll ask the question to be succinct and the answers to uh, be succinct as well. I'm going to challenge you folks. Thank you, thanks. Okay, I'm gonna be fast, gosh. Um, so my question is around real life and online events around launching, because at the end of the go-to-market strategy is the launch. We are launching soon, and we found it really interesting, concise, concise, um, to kind of leverage the benefit of launching in a metaverse like Decentraland and converting the users there, you know, that, that can enable them to download a platform. 
when it's to real life events because our audience is Web 2 and Web 3. So what is your, opi what is your opinion about real life versus online launching events? I mean, I could take that. I, it depends where your core market is. Like, who are you solving the problem for and where they are? If they're there, yeah. Um, I mean, an event in the metaverse is going to be the best way to reach them. You know, that's sort of like a channel optimization problem. If the best place to demo your product is in the metaverse, that's another excellent reason to do it. Um, whether or not real life is, you know, whether that juice is worth the squeeze uh, kind of depends on what you're looking to get out of the event. A lot of times, like, partnerships, you know, can accelerate the development of your product, and so that's a reason to do it. But, um, yeah, I guess. Different. Oh, sorry. If you thank you, if you have two different communities, Web two and Web three, your messaging has to be different to each because their motivations are different for coming into that ecosystem. So it cannot be one message to two different parties because then you're losing the message that you're actually sending out. Was that succinct enough? That yeah. was brilliant. Yeah. In fact, give this man a hand. In fact, give the whole panel a hand. So it's brilliant. Absolutely brilliantly done. Is there any concluding remarks from you guys? And oh, I'm going to challenge you, 30 seconds each, okay. no I was, more. I was just going to say, like, and also differentiating between real life and online is like a thin line to walk on, right? What, what does that even mean? It goes back to channel optimization. Where are your users and how are you going to get the biggest impact? I want to challenge all of you to come talk to us after, but I, I personally think that launches are, you know, f of a product. They are exactly what has, you know, that's what's been happening in Web3 until now. Launches are for, you know, to me, they're overrated. Like, ha have events that are for actual impactful, you know, milestones along product that you have, or like onboarding people to something. It's not. It's not. You know, the launch itself is 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 overrated. Have events potentially also of you know as as your users get the impact and as they go along. I think that's more important. Yeah. Neil, anything to conclude? No, I agree. I agree. I, I guess I was going to say. <laughs> I guess I was going to say, do you mean a launch as in a TGA? It was exactly that exact point. Is it a specific thing that you're looking, or are you just looking to launch your product and project, you know, for, for the longer term? That, that's what you kind of need to consider. But I kind of feel like um, you want us to move along this. So. Hi, guys. Look.